Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. So our today talk is about a Scrum team. And we are trying to answer the question, can a Scrum team be great or uh, is that a bait? So are there any, any uh, Meatbusters fan in the room? <laughs> Many? Yeah. OK. Cool. So uh, this is kind of Scrum edition. And uh, yeah, we are. Ilya, Predrag, and Anna Maria. We all are delivery managers at Levi 9 IT Services. And uh, what we also do at Levi 9 is a Scrum coaching. And for that one, we did a lot of cool stuff together. As a Scrum coach, most of the time you encounter a challenge of busting some toxic and prevalent misconceptions around Scrum. And uh, all that in order to leverage your team's agility, autonomy, happiness, uh, yeah, success. And by doing so, three of us realized we have a lot of fun together. So in a way, we couldn't resist to, to come here as a group, trying to bust some, well, three uh, of many common myths around Scrum. Uh, so these are the myths. Meet number one, only a self-designed team can reach a high-performing stage. Meet two, only 100% is success. And meet number three, Scrum welcomes any change at any time. So why we do that by busting meets? Because we learned that only teams that fight their demons can uh, grow and move on. So let's get our hands dirty and uh, yeah, please, please save uh, your questions for the end. We'll be happy to have some good discussions uh, later on. So meet one says that only a team that has self-design can reach a high performing stage. I have two youngsters at home who are pretty much obsessed with movies about superheroes saving the world. And uh, they used to believe that any crisis situation, either in their small universe or, or in the world outside, could have been easily resolved only if guys like Superman, Batman, Iron Man, and, and few others would come together. And then recently, this was actually this year, I think it came as a surprise, Batman versus Superman. So how is it possible that even superb guys are not able to act as one as of the very first day they, they team up? Uh, researchers indicate that the way we design a team is the most critical factor to its performance. Uh, Richard Hackman, <coughs> professor of um, social psychology at Yale and Harvard University, so probably the man was into the subject, he has been studying teams for decades, and one of his most significant findings was so-called 60-30-10 principle. It's quite simple. It says that 60% uh, of the variation in team effectiveness is attributable to the way the team is designed, 30% to the way the team is launched, and only 10% to the way the team is coached. Now, what does it actually mean to design a team? Let's take a look at two ways to design. There is self-selection, where people emerge uh, into teams on their own. So people decide themselves what, they, what team they, they will work with. And on the other side, there is a managerial selection, where people are assembled into teams by an executive stipulation. Although uh, managerial selection is probably more common and uh, more traditional way, to design, uh, self-selection is also not an unproven idea. So now a bit of history. Uh, during the World War II, at the early 40s, uh, UK Royal Air Force had to uh, form new Lancaster bomber crews after relatively short training periods. And yeah, they had to do it rather quickly because the war was already on. And someone came up with a creative solution to have these teams formed by having them self-selected. So how did they do that? All the trainees were taken into a large mess room. And uh, yeah, there was no influence of senior commanders or uh, any, any instructions, no regimentation whatsoever. So guys were just told 
that they have limited time to make up their fireman crews. And uh, yeah, with, with no guidance and rules, the trainees had to rely entirely on their gut instincts to select uh, what team to join. The result was uh, one of the most effective uh, flight crews in the history of the world ever. And so far it is still known as one of the most successful and earliest uh, self-selections at large scale. Nowadays we do it a bit differently uh, in uh, scaled uh, agile environments with all kinds of readiness checks and uh, pretty well prepared self-selection events where product owners explain their visions. But the principle behind it is pretty much the same. People naturally tend to form uh, small cross-functional themes and that is why self-selection has proven effective. Uh, normally no one would choose to work on more than one team or project unless he's a masochist, yeah, and people easily communicate face-to-face. -face. Uh, there is shared goal that makes everything so much easier. So at the end people are highly motivated, that they get a lot of work done and they enjoy the whole experience. Uh, what happens if there is whichever reason not to do it that way, to do it more traditional way, where people are, teams are designed by, by management? Are there any chances to uh, get a team designed by management to a high performing state? So managerial selection is basically a quick way to get it done. Resource managers design teams based on the uh, understanding of people's capabilities, personalities, preferences, and all kinds of relationships between them. And they do that uh, yeah, with the awareness of, of interactions between people, of those perspectives, uh, or they are yeah, either already aware of those interactions or, or know how to reach that awareness, hopefully. Yeah. Uh, and uh, most of the time they come up with team compositions that are mostly right. But as many companies grow quickly, uh, it becomes increasingly difficult to understand the intricacies of relationships between people uh, as the number of relationships exponentially grows. So it seems pretty easy to advocate self-selection as the best possible and basically the only way to design a superb teams. Now here is the catch. No matter how our team was designed at first, it naturally needs to go through certain stages before it gets to the good shape. And uh, we all probably know Bruce Tuckman's model of teams development, which says that each team needs to go through them. So forming, storming, norming, performing. At first there is a forming stage where all team members are positive, some of them are very enthusiastic, some are a bit anxious they, because they still have no clue on how to do that or, or what needs to be done. And uh, yeah, then people start to push against their boundaries. They start to challenge each other's authorities, integrities and all kinds of frustrations and conflicts are possible at this stage. And. Uh, Gradually, people start to resolve those differences and team moves into the norming stage. There are constructive debates and people start to accept each other's strengths, weaknesses, authorities. So buying and clarity are finally achieved. And only at that point, a team can move into performing state where there is no friction. Now let's assume we have such a performing team. We are still only half a way done. So it's all about continuous improvement. Sometimes we need to move older players out, like in a soccer team, to move younger players in, or to simply face up to non-performing players. And that's perfectly fine, because it assures constant flow. And we'll get to the flow a bit later. So, in other words, in order to build a high-performing team, one needs to set certain stage and raise certain conditions. Well, easier said than done. Let's take a look at what it 
it uh, takes for team to reach high performing state. At first, there need to be a goal, common and compelling purpose that makes sense to all of us, that is in a way irresistible to all of us. So the buy-in of every single team member is achieved and uh, consequently, it's pretty much the same like we have self-selected uh, at first. And then this goal is obviously not something I can achieve on my own, otherwise why would I need a team? And this would be like a foundation. Now we need to set some pillars. We, we tend to call them C pillars. Clarity. It uh, needs to be there because only in clear environment uh, teams can make good decisions. So clarity of all ingredients. Uh, roles. I need to know what my role in the team is. I need to know what are the roles of the others. Then boundaries. Each team needs to know what are boundaries of its uh, autonomy, authority, clarity of conditions of satisfaction. So everything basically. Then a competence. In order to, to build up, a team needs to have an access to expertise that is required for achieving the goal. And that can be either by means to develop uh, their own set of uh, collective intelligence and, and uh, functions or by being provided with an expert eye when it doesn't make sense to, to invest into development of a scarce knowledge for a team. Then a course and by course here we mean direction so teams and processes simply go together. Uh, each team needs to come up with a few operating principles jointly agreed upon them uh, in order to have effective processes that eliminate waste and only, only with uh, waste eliminated a uh, team can stick to its course, can yeah, follow the, the, the collective outcome. And then a coherence and uh, yeah, by coherence we mean a lot of things here. Of course, uh, exceptionally good communication needs to be established and maintained among team members and yeah, without it, uh, unity of purpose is gone. Each team moves as uh, fast as it communicates, a team moves as well as it communicates. Then there has to be a solid relationship uh, based on trust, respect, acceptance, understanding. We don't really have to be the best friends, but we need to accept each other, to understand each other. Uh, then, in uh, scaled environments, no team is an island, and yeah, therefore each team needs to be very well connected to the rest of the world. So, coherence by all means. And now we have foundation, we have some pillars, that's great. So. I see the purpose and I have you guys to make it together with you. It's all clear to us what we need to do, how we can do that. Uh, we know what it takes and uh, we know what the path is. We talk to each other, we talk to the rest of the world, we understand and adapt based on that understanding. That's all fine, you have me in, but only for a while. I need something more. We all need something yeah, sexy and irresistible that keeps us in some really uh, powerful roof to, to, to glue us all together. So there needs to be an appropriate challenge because it assures flow. If the challenge is too easy, we get bored. If it's too hard, we'll give up. And flow is very important here because it basically feeds a need for an excitement. And if I'm all excited about this challenge, yeah, there is no predictability. And we definitely don't want predictability in our everyday work because, yeah, it kills innovation. So having said that, this is basically a foundation, pillars and roof for a high performing team. So those are the stages and conditions for building such a team. And now to get back to the original myth, uh, which says that only team designed by themselves can reach a high performing stage. We believe this myth is busted because strongly effective teams do not just happen by some magic. Even if we assume that uh, self-selection is the best way to go, it is still only 60% of a good chance to make it great. If we self-select and just stop there, 
we might fall into so-called zero trap of teams. And that is calling any group of people a team and then expecting astonishing result. It simply doesn't work that way. Uh, the first day a group of people come together as a team, hopefully, uh, is pretty much like the first day a baby is delivered. So it takes time to grow. And in order to, to raise a superb, kick-ass, high-performing team, we need to really cautiously, deliberately, and, and constantly uh, cultivate an effective teamwork. So the meat seems to be busted, and now I'm going to invite Ilya to try busting or confirming another one. Yes, let me first see this. Did I turn it? Yeah, it's on. Let me just see. Okay. Hello all, I'm Ilya, and um, my meet is about one, only 100% is success. Uh, how, how to approach this meet first? Uh, let, let me clarify what it means. So this is a situation where a scrum team only delivering 100% of its delivery is, to trigger, is uh, considered successful. Uh, in order to better see how this team may work, l let me tell you a little story. Once upon a time, there was a team delivering 100% of its commitment. Uh, this team was a scrum team. They had their scrum practices fairly <laughs> developed. They had their refinement process in place. They, they were using concepts of definition of done and definition of ready. Uh, yeah, so they were de 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 delivering full commitment and uh, their product owner was quite satisfied. Uh, he was praising them all the time, calling them a great team. And because of this, of course, team was also feeling a bit, uh, yeah, he very happy about themselves. So um, everything looked uh, very fine. Uh, this was happening o on the outside. On the inside, there were some perks that team uh, was having every sprint. Every time someone need, needed to rush to make things happen. Uh, so in the, those last days of a sprint, uh, someone always had to push the fi fi final deployment, commit the code, quickly fix the bug. So team did everything it, it could just to make this 100%. Uh, sometimes s some defects were postponed, uh, and this, this gave a room to, for technical depth also to, to slowly uh, build up. So. In the end, it was a bit stressful period. There was also overtime hours uh, involved. So in the end, yeah, maybe they were quite nervous in the last eight days of the sprint, but in the end, they managed to do it. Also, some items were quite heavy uh, to be delivered. There are some, there, there were some difficult functionalities. So in this case, when they have something like this, teams usually just play it safe. So let's not bother, let's not take any risks. Let's just commit to less, and then we will be sure that we will make this 100%, which is our success. And in the end, indeed, everything looked very nice. Increment was rolling out, release, release after release. Uh, so team also was feeling great about themselves. They, did, they didn't see much need of uh, inspect and adapt of learning. They were already there 100%. That's the goal, right? So retrospective meetings were often canceled. In, in other occasions, they were also j j just some sh sharing a couple of jokes, etc. So retrospective was not uh, used uh, much by, by this team. And then what happened? Uh, in one sprint, it happened that team was not able to deliver 100%. So they tried to do everything, but simply it was not possible. What actually happened here is the nature of our IT industry business, because it is dynamic and it is uh, it has many changes happening on an everyday basis, so sometimes it's really difficult to, to, to for, for, uh, foresee some things. Uh, this is one of the reasons. Other reason is no matter how team, this team was good, no matter how their investigation of the story up front was, was good, they can easily miss some estimate, right? right? It, it can happen. So in this print, they also missed uh, estimates, and th that's why they, they were having a hard time to catch up. And lastly, also, what was the cherry on top of a cake is the product owner who, who this sprint had a re really a lot of changes. Uh, why, do he, why did he have these changes? Basically, it is to just uh, f for the product to remain relevant and to remain viable on the market. Uh, isn't Scrum business about it in, at the end to have viable products? 
So that's why he, he had these changes which, uh, which made it even more harder for this team to deliver. Though they, they lived to fight another day, so yeah, they were not fired or anything, but actually they, they were feeling very sad about themselves because they didn't reach their, their goal. Uh, team happiness is actually tied to the team purpose, and uh, in this case, team purpose was to have already all, uh, all the time 100% delivery rate. So this time they, they didn't do it, so they f fell into depression. They, they maybe start to e even question uh, each other, blaming perhaps. So what went wrong? Uh, team then decided that, that the best thing that you can do in Scrum, because in Scrum, when you need to answer this question, you need to organize a retrospective meeting. So on this meeting, uh, team sat together, and f after a long time, they actually had a, a really good discussion about their team values, team principles, and they actually wanted to redefine their success criteria. Is it still okay or not okay? Do we need to change something? As soon as they started discussing, some crucial questions started to emerge. So the first question was, should the team forecast or commit to the work to be done in a sprint? Uh, if you remember, in the initial release of Scrum Guide, the word commitment was used, and this word was meant to mean that uh, team should commit to do their best in the, in the sprint. Uh, however, this word in time started to be misused, either by product owner or by development team, uh, because it, it became more of a contractual obligation. So st teams slowly started to, to, to understand this word as something that you are committing to means that you will deliver it 100%, uh, that we, we can count on it, we can plan on it. So uh, if you don't deliver it, you should be punished or pay any penalties, right? Uh, because of this misinterpretation, there was actually a Scrum uh, revision, Scrum Guide revision in 2011, we, and the word commitment was replaced with word forecast. Uh, the meaning of this change was to put emphasis on reality. So in reality, IT world is dynamic. IT world is, is changing all the time. Technologies are changing, evolving. So the best teams can do is to forecast w what they think I it is possible for a sprint. Uh, what we like to use actually is commitment. So our conscious, conscious decision was to keep up with commitment. Uh, why did we decide to do that? For us, Commitment is more about the stance of a team. Commitment is more active stance, while forecast is a passive. So let me share one example. So if I was a product owner and team came to me and, and they tell me, hi, Ilya, tomorrow will be a raining day. And then what I can do? I can say, OK, thank you for the info. Sounds like there's nothing we can do. We have to deal with it. I don't feel very happy, but I have to accept it. On the other hand, if, 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 if I was again a product owner and team approaches me and they tell me, hi, Leah, yeah, tomorrow will be a raining day, but we already thought about it. We prepared umbrellas. We will do the best we can not to let us, the rain stop us. Then I, as a product owner, feel, feel much more confident and happy. So this is the, this subtle difference that, that, that counts for us. And of course, as I mentioned, there is a pitfall that commitment can be turned into contractual obligation. So what we do about that is actually discussion, discussion, and education. We already talked to our teams uh, that how commitment sh sh should be uh, understood as well to, to our product owners. So this was the first question. So team decided, OK, maybe we should commit to stuff. What should we commit to? Uh, team used to commit to the percentage of delivery. So maybe 100% what was their, let's say, commitment. But in Scrum, actually, there's a, there is a powerful tool called the Sprint Goal. And the sprint goal is something that should capture the purpose of each iteration. And it should, it should show the business value that this iteration, each iteration should contribute to the product overall. So what does that mean in practice? <coughs> Sorry. What does that mean in practice? Uh, that means that actually sometimes 70% of your sprint backlog can fulfill the sprint goal. Sometimes 90%. It's not always 100. So what happens with the remaining percentage. Uh, what we like to use is must-have, need-to-have approach, where we like to divide our backlog into two sections. One is the must-have, which clearly is communicated and ag agreed up front, that these items sh are di direct directly related to the sprint goal, and they are uh, by meeting those items, we will deliver sprint goal. And the other items are, of course, not free to fail. Don't get me wrong. The other items are on only other items which are indirectly contributing or 
contributing to some other, let's say, technical stuff. And we, of course, need to deliver the whole commitment if, if we uh, committed to it. We will need to try it, definitely. And if something of this to fail, we, of course, need to go to retrospective and to discuss it. So there is no difference in uh, the process, how, how we deal with if it's failed. But uh, again, this, this helps our teams to have a bit more focus. So uh, now we have team which will commit to fulfill some sprint goal, and sprint goal should uh, yeah, guarantee business value being delivered. So where does product quality come in, co comes in? As you know, in Scrum, uh, product owner is the one who is ordering uh, the priority of items. So, and Scrum is also driven by business value. So if product owner, uh, let's say, doesn't care about the quality or at least short-term quality, then it will not get on our backlog, right? What Scrum is actually offering is another tool to control quality, and it is definition of done. Definition of done as a checklist of items which you should fulfill for each story to be completed or to become realizable in the end. Uh, so this is used often by the teams and it is used on user story level. And this indeed uh, increases the quality and increases the, the, the quality of the functionality or feature being delivered. But then also it, it can be short-sighted when it comes to overall product quality. Uh, in order to to address this a bit more structurally, uh, we also introduced, uh, introduced a concept called the definition of done on sprint level. So we, want, we like using the both, bo both aspects. So definition of done on user story level, definition of done on sprint level. What this, this gives us a chance actually to uh, monitor and tra track items which are not directly related to stories or functionalities, but are more general about the application of product itself. Such items may be technical depth, test coverage, uh, maintainability, or maybe some other non-functional requirement. So it, again, depends on the project environment. And you, you uh, as a team, should go back and figure out what it means for you. But basically, this concept is something that we found useful. In the end, also, the question was, uh, should it be ambitious or predictable? Or if I can even rephrase this question, is how much risk a team should take when they are committing? Should they always play it safe, only commit to the items they are uh, almost absolutely sure that they will deliver? Or should they take a risk, maybe take a few items more, maybe some improvements, some innovations, etc.? Uh, to maybe elaborate a bit on this, we can uh, imagine the three situations that are possible theoretically after each sprint. Team can either deliver, over deliver, or under deliver their commitment. What we like to see actually is the mix of these three situations. So when teams are all sometimes delivering, sometimes doing more, sometimes failing, that's for us the, the best indicator that teams are alive, teams are dynamic, teams are indeed agile. So ma ma making them uh, fail, uh, if, if the team fails sometimes, that can result in an immediate drop in veloc velocity, but in long term that can also uh, lead to lear lear learning opportunities and to overall increase in velocity in the long run. Uh, so, after all of this, um, I think we can confirm that this myth is busted. There are three main reasons why this myth should be busted. The first reason is because of the IT industry itself. IT industry itself is sometimes unpredictable. Things are happening fast. Things are changing fast. So that's why it's very difficult to make uh, let's say this obligation that you will deliver 100% in one, one uh, period of time. Other big obstacle is that if we put this as a success criteria, that then it will put teams in defensive mode, teams will stop thinking about innovation, they will stop experimenting and then they, they will not learn, they will not grow and they will not develop themselves as well. And the third main reason is because if you always insist on 100% delivery, uh, then you, you subconsciously uh, introduce technical debt, you forget about bugs, and et cetera, et cetera. So the team becomes uh, less and less maintainable, and you make your stuff even harder for you next sprints. So what is the answer here? How to find the balance? Basically, one such uh, team can make their success criteria to, uh, to deliver full commitment in 80% of times and use the other 20% of times to, to uh, grow, develop, experiment. And actually, to, to, to correct myself, it's not only about delivery. So in 80% of time, it is only important to meet the sprint goal and sprint definition of done. 
So if this, that team can do that and use the other 20% to try, try and fail, learn, uh, inspect and adapt, then that team could be successful. Of course, each team and each product environment, project environment is different uh, from each other, so each team should define the, it, this for themselves. Uh, so that's it about number, meet number two. I will now ask uh, Predrag to elaborate a bit on the next meet. Thank you, Ilya. Uh, stick around with us. Cocktail party is uh, around the corner. Uh, let me start uh, by first introducing the myth number three. It says uh, Scrum welcomes any change at any time. Uh, let me also ask you uh, two questions. Uh, first one is uh, how, much, uh, how many of you are practicing uh, Scrum? Thanks. Nice. It seems we are in the right place. Yeah. Uh, the second one uh, is how many of you uh, received the call uh, from product owner during a sprint demanding a sprint scope change? Again, uh, in, the <laughs> in the right place. Uh, let's face it, guys. Uh, in everyday life, uh, change can happen at any time. Uh, it is our reality, right? So even at the beginning, uh, we can say that it, uh, this myth is confirmed. Sounds familiar? So let's, uh, let's now see uh, what we can do to prepare and to welcome, uh, to welcome our change. Uh, the answer we are offering is uh, adaptive planning. We engage in adaptive planning uh, based on agile manifesto principles. In short, those are welcoming changes and regular adaption to changing circumstances. And how do we achieve uh, this adaptive planning? We achieve it using a constant backlog refinement. Uh, facilitative, of course, uh, we have many, uh, many different tools. So let me present now uh, six of tools that we are using that can come in, uh, come in handy for everybody. Uh, first, in my, in my experience, uh, the most important uh, tool is uh, called full-blown refinement. Uh, we strive to give 100% of ourselves uh, to make this uh, activity uh, a success, to make this tool a success. Uh, in practice, what we actually do is we do the requirement clarification, uh, we do the detailed breakdown, we do the sizing, and we do the planning. Uh, bear in mind that all of these activities needs to be effectively executed. If you fail one, it can lead uh, to failing in all of them. Furthermore, we know that, uh, prepar that preparation is half of the success, right? So we, uh, we do other activities uh, in order to prepare for a full-blown refinement meeting. One of them, and our, our tool number two, is called informal refinement. Why informal? Informal means that you can do it on your own or with a team uh, whenever you have a uh, time for it. Uh, here, what can come in handy is a technique that uh, we used to, that we like to call uh, three amigos technique. Uh, this technique uh, involves three different expertise, or as Scrum likes to say, uh, three different roles. Uh, those are development, testing, uh, and product owner. All of them combined uh, in requirements clarification and uh, drafting initial, uh, initial questions for the, uh, <coughs> for the full bone refinement meeting. So uh, let's, let's now spice things up a bit and make it more personal. Uh, I really enjoy cooking. Maybe this picture is a fake uh, because my management forbid me to put one with a beer and barbecue and everything, right? Uh, but th th this should do. So uh, once in a while, uh, I like to throw dinner for my friends uh, and just enjoy, hang out, right, and eat food. And uh, I hope they like my food, right? So uh, how, how do I start? Usually, my fridge is a mess, right? I hope the guys can relate to that. Yeah? Uh, th uh, there are some things standing inside uh, for days, even weeks. I mean, I'm ashamed to admit, but it's so, yeah. Similar to our backlog, uh, I have to start cleaning up the old and not needed items, putting in front the more important ones. Uh, by doing so, I, can, uh, I have a much greater uh, clarity what I'm missing, what I need to buy, or what I need to throw out. So you, you get the picture already. Uh, the process like this, uh, and our third tool is called the triage call. Uh, recommendation is to do it now and then, uh, for example, monthly, quarterly, uh, depending on your project dynamics. So to move back with the story, uh, now I have a clean fridge, so logically the shopping is in order. Uh, when going shopping, uh, I always have a list of groceries with me, uh, because otherwise I end up spending a lot more than I intended, buying something I really, really don't need. 
So to compile this list, uh, I need to uh, I need to think in advance to plan plan for that dinner. Uh, I need to uh, I need to think what are the main items, what are the order of preparation, the quantities, uh, the timing. Uh, the point is that I need to visualize the process. By doing so, I can stay concentrated on the dinner itself and buy uh, buying uh, save money, buying only the buying only the necessities. Uh, we can do the same with our product backlog. We need to visualize the work. Uh, we need to create a top-down approach uh, guided by the product vision and achieved through completing our development tasks. Uh, the process, this process is actually called user story mapping. And our fourth tool, uh, going forward with the story. Uh, now I have a clean fridge, I have a groceries, uh, so I'm ready, ready to start working. Uh, a while ago, I uh, started cooking following a recipe that I received from my uh, friend. However, not all steps uh, were clear to me uh, because it was something new and I just borrowed the, the recipe. Uh, so what to do in that situation? Uh, my logical answer uh, was to call that friend because uh, dinner, dinner was uh, around the corner and the friends are starting knocking on the door and you get the picture. So I took the phone and rang him. Uh, luckily, uh, he was there. Uh, he was willing to help me, and uh, we started discussing. Uh, he gave me the first instructions. Uh, whenever I had a doubt during cooking, uh, I called him again, and uh, he was there to support me. Uh, what, he did, uh, what he did actually is also uh, guide me through the techniques, how to prepare the gro groceries and, uh, and how to process them. So that, that, really, uh, that, really, <coughs> sorry. Uh, that really helped me. Uh, the whole point of this, uh, this story, guys, is actually in, um, in uh, engagement and availability of product owner. Uh, you should try to have a, a setup with product owner fully engaged. Uh, by engaging product owner, you can, uh, you can uh, by engaging product owner, you can, um, uh, besides, have, uh, besides sharing more light on your requirements, you can also uh, boost uh, the team's morale. So, uh, during cooking, Every, every, everybody of us uh, usually tastes food several times, right? Uh, why do we do that? Uh, we do it because we want to uh, be able to adjust our ingredients timely, uh, making sure that we are building the right thing that will taste perfectly. So I'm asking myself and I'm asking you, why shouldn't we do the same with uh, our software development? Uh, let the developers, let, let the software developers uh, show their work uh, in early stages of development, so while still in progress. Give the product owner a chance for a sneak preview. He will, you will be able then to receive a fast feedback whether you are developing, whether you are developing the right thing. So through, th uh, through these uh, six, through these simple real life story examples, uh, we have presented to you uh, some tools that we find uh, handy for uh, for uh, for this kind of uh, actions. Uh, these tools, bear in mind, uh, that are just some of the ways how to facilitate constant backlog uh, refinement or adaptive planning. Uh, based, <coughs> based on my, my experience, as we said in the beginning, uh, the change is inevitable and it's, it's our reality. Don't, no, question to, uh, no question to that. So therefore, uh, we can say that uh, our third myth saying that Scrum welcomes any change at any time is actually confirmed. So to go back to the, to the entire mid, uh, our Scrum edition of mid busting, uh, the score is uh, two busted and uh, one confirmed. Uh, we really hope that we uh, offered some, valuables tool, some valuable tools on how to resolve these kind of myths uh, with your, within your teams. Uh, please bear in mind that each team needs a time and condition to grow. They need to be ready for the winning and to know what the success is for them and they, want, uh, they need to be uh, able to uh, welcome and control the change. And for the end, uh, guys, uh, we all face some challenges within our Scrum teams. Uh, please buzz them or confirm them. Just don't let them stand in, uh, in your way. Thank you. We are happy to answer to some questions if you have. No. <laughs> Thank you all for being here and for taking time. And uh, see you downstairs on, uh, on drinks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>